Okay, well, thank you so much again for having me, for inviting me to this uh, really inspiring uh, first workshop, of course, and now uh, the conference and uh, or maybe uh, the second uh, the second conf the second workshop. Let me share my screen. Um, in Kafka's Metamorphosis, the now legendary protagonist Gregor Samsa, before becoming a monstrous vermin, was a respectable salesman of fabrics who, because of the humble conditions of his family had been forced to provide for his parents under a strict boss who systematically humiliated him. Marina Warner, in her book, uh, um, uh, Fantastic Metamorphosis of 2002, suggests that uh, the Ovidian figure recalled by Kafka might be Arachne. This modernist tale, Warner writes, gives us the possibility to and I quote to follow the fate of the bug after the change, as if Ovid has remained with Arachne, attentive to her mental state after Minerva had spelled down her uh, in, in the shape of a spider. This association between the ancient and modern figures allows us to identify some aspects of the Ovidian tale that are interesting for the purposes of our workshop. David Gallagher, for example, has noted that Gregor Samsa seems to parallel Arachne because both usurp the position of the father in the family by daring to believe, though in different ways, that they are a better worker. Gregor's attempt to usurp the patriarchal function is punished by his transformation into an insect. As in, as in the case of Arachne, the previous hierarchical order is re-established after the humiliating transformation into an insect, with, however, a major difference. While Samsa as insect can no, long, can no longer carry out his duties, Arachne as a spider is compelled precisely to continue endlessly, endlessly waving her webs. Her transformation, I argue in this paper, can be read as the metamorphosis of work into labor. And uh, my title is inspired to this book by André Gortz, uh, Metamor uh, Metamorphose du Travail, translated into, in, into English uh, with uh, the title Critique of Economic Reason. Um, question related to Arachne's material activity have been rather marginalized within Ovidian criticism. The major preoccupation of scholars has been, of course, to investigate on the one hand the possible identification between Ovid himself as a rebellious anti augustan artist, eventually forced into exile, which is a sort of humiliating transformation, of course, and of the other to identify in Arachne's waving, waving an original aesthetic manifesto opposed to the, to the officiality of Roman epic, as for instance, represented by Virgil's Aeneid. In, in any case, scholars have been mainly attracted by the pathological implications of the tapestries woven by Minerva and Arachne, much more than by the opening of the episode and the final transformation, treated almost as an essential uh, embellishment, uh, embellishments of the ekphrastic core. More recently, attention has been devoted to the gendered implications of this tale, in particular, Patricia Salzman Mitchell in her book, A Web of Fantasies, insists on the necessity of stressing the visual components of waving and to think of waving as a means available to women to create visually and to have a gaze on their own. Perhaps more interestingly for our discussion, John Heath draws attention to the association in the ancient world between spinning and webbing on the one hand and telling of mythological stories on the other. In what follows, I try to focus on some aspects of this widely discussed episode through the lens provided by our hosts, Dell and Jordan, i.e. a discussion of the nature of work and labor in ancient Rome. What meaning can be attached to the Arachne episode from this perspective? 
what is the role of Arachne's job weaving within the symbolic universe, uh, universe of Roman culture and of the metamorphosis in particular? What is the meaning of Arachne's transformation into a spider? What larger symbolic relevance might it have for the perception of work and labor in ancient Rome and beyond? Um, Arachne makes her first appearance in Roman literature in book six of Ovid's Metamorphosis, and only in late antiquity will she, uh, will she manifest herself again, most memorably in Claudian and Sidonius Apollinaris. In book four of the Metamorphosis, the first human narrators in the text, the impious Miniades, are depicted waving while they, they tell stories. And in the second part of book five, Minerva pays a visit to the muses from whom she hears the story of the contest between themselves and the Pierides. In book six, Minerva is now eager to earn praise for herself by displaying her superiority to a human being, a girl from, from Eonia called Arachne. Um, already at the beginning of the tale, atten uh, of the tale, great attention is devoted to the fact that Arachne's family is humble. Her wondrous skill in working wool is enhanced by her poor origins. Her father, Edmund of Colophon, and you can follow what I'm telling you uh, in the passage. Uh, her father, Edmund of Colophon, is a worker who dies all, and her mother's absence is emphasized by Ovid at 610, as you can read, uh, Okiderat uh, Okider Mater. Arachne's fame is great, although her, her origins are as humble as her hometown, Ipa Epa, is small. Line 13, Parva Parvis Abitabat Ipa Epis. Her fame is so great that even the nymphs would leave their woods um, and rivers in order to admire not only her final products, but also Arachne herself while working. Um, nec factas solum vestes uh, spectare juvabat, tunco que confierente, tantus decus adfuit arti. Uh, line 19, uh, 18. So. At this point, Ovid offers uh, a vivid description of Arachne's uh, various uh, skilled movements while working the, uh, the, the, the wool. And uh, um, uh, uh, lines 19 through uh, 23 contains a certain uh, a, a series of verbs uh, glomerabat, subigebat, molibat, versabat, pingebat. However, although anyone would realize that she had learned from Pallas, goddess of course of waving, Skires a palla de doctam, line 23, Arachne furiously denies this. Quota menipsa negat. This is line 20, uh, 24. Uh, taking offense at a teacher so great, tantaque offensa magistra, thereby denying a relationship of apprenticeship, um, apprenticeship and challenging uh, her to a contest. I.e., she doesn't uh, she doesn't really identify herself with uh, with the profession. Minerva uh, with a, with a, with a, let's say tradition of the profession. Uh, Minerva uh, then appears in the form of an old woman trying to convince her to apologize, but Arachne remains stubborn and after Minerva reveals herself, the contest between the famous artists begins. They work simultaneously but separately on their own tapestries. Constitunt diversis uh, partibus ambe, and uh, um, so that the one cannot see what the other is representing. And both the narrator observes in an especially interesting expression are so focused that their studium denies the lab, the lab, the labor, uh, uh, studio fallente laborem. Ovid describes first Minerva's uh, work, then Arachnis, both containing mythical subject matter, vetus argumentum. 
As amply discussed by critics, these two artifacts not only represent very divergent views on the gods, but more intriguingly, they display radically different styles of representation. Minerva conceives the space of her web according to an ordered, rather conformist strategy, placing Jupiter at the center surrounded by 12 deities. And at the four corners, she places four smaller scenes representing divine punishments towards humans that should serve as a warning, as an example, let's say, to Arachne, Uttamenex simplis intelegat emula la lauris. Sorry, this is uh, later. Minerva's entire composition is bordered by olive wreaths her own attribute. By contrast, Arachne creates a series of panels without a defined structure or narrative coherence, representing mostly animals, which the observer is invited um, to interpret and transformed gods raping human women. Um, at this point, the goddess furious with envy first destroys the Pictae Vestis, and then beats Arachne uh, on the head with her shuttle. Um, this is a little bit later, I guess. Um, yes. Okay. Um, when the girl tries to hang herself, Minerva finally takes mercy, pendentem miserata and allows her to continue her life, but as a spider whose destiny is to hang forever. Vive quidem pende tamen improba. And uh, so uh, uh, this is a particular interesting line for us since uh, of course vive life and work, let's say, pendere as a, as a, a materialization of, uh, of the very action of, uh, of waving. Um, Arachne's abilities in waving and spinning are closely described. Ovid lingers on these aspects at various moments, emphasizing not only the precision and beauty of the representation, but also the way in which Arachne executes her work. She's the daughter of our humble worker, and this is the domestic and social environment within which she develops her marvelous ability in waving and spinning. As Ovid says, she's characterized exclusively by her skills, and these skills are given more prominence by her, her humble origins, as well as the fact that rather unusually, I would say for Ovidian narrative, nothing is said about her bodily appearance. I would say that by zeroing all uh, these other aspects, Arachne's uh, uh, portentous skills uh, are clearly what the text emphasizes. At the beginning, uh, moreover, the nymphs leaving behind the woods and rivers come to admire the girl while uh, she's working and they enjoy precisely her technical grace while she's creating her tapestries. To be sure, Minerva is also a skilled waver so that, as we have seen, the reader is invited to imagine that Arachne is her pupil, Skires Apalla de Doctum. But this professional affiliation is precisely what the girl so fiercely denies. Her adamantine trust in her own abilities is the narrative motor of the entire episode. It elicits Minerva's indignant reaction, reaction, and I would argue it also represents the motivation for Arachne's transformation into a spider. Um, as previously mentioned, critics have been uh, mainly uh, attracted by the uh, aesthetic and poetological implications of this episode, focusing mostly on both ekphrasis as models of the textuality of metamorphosis itself. While more recently, feminist scholars have compellingly shown that visuality and the material aspects of the tapestries also play an important role, especially because they emphasize the differences between, we might say, a masculine textuality and a feminine visuality. 
In an inspiring article, Ellen Oliensis interprets the waving contest in terms not of opposition, but of rivalry between two factors. Oliensis sees an important difference between Minerva's and Arachne's tapestry. While the goddess has a clear agenda and her intention is evidently to teach a lesson to her adversary, especially uh, through the four panels placed at the corners, Arachne does not offer any such directions for the interpretation of her opus. She's a prolific artist and as audiences observers, and I quote, the unquenchable fertility of the gods is matched by the copia of Arachne's episodic representation, as if Arachne had an inexhaustible supply of material at her disposal and were trying to cram in as much as she could before, the time, before her time was up. Along these lines, Oliensis astutely, astutely notices that Arachne not only does not criticize the abusive behavior of the gods she represents, but she even aligns with it. The first line of Arachne's ekphrasis are exemplary on this point. Um, uh, Arachne stands with Job. I won't read the, 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 the text. Oliensis convincingly argues for an identification of Arachnis with Jupiter. Arachnis, Arachne, she, she writes, stands with Job while uh, the viewers of this, uh, uh, of this tapestry, uh, we readers and also Minerva, are situated alongside uh, Europa and the, as the victims of a ravishingly potent image. In other words, while Minerva is explicitly interested in launching a clear message to Arachne and, of course, the observers of her tapestry, and then the readers for whom the message, um, a message needs to be articulated in words, Arachne is perfectly happy with her sole medium of waving, which she controls with uh, such supreme mastery. And while Minerva needs to emphasize her active participation in the phallic accomplishments she's representing, Arachne is simply enacting her creative potency as she waves, while she shares with the gods a transformative power. There is also a difference at another level. While Arachne has a real audience consisting of the nymphs admiring her very real technical uh, uh, talents, literally in theory, cum fierent, Minerva creates in her tapestry a fictional audience for herself, consisting of her father Jupiter and the other gods surrounding him. That is, while Arachne is a real actor exhibiting her skills in the real world outside of her artistic tapestry, Minerva remains trapped by and within her own illusion. In a minor but not significant detail, Minerva's approach to her own work enacts a, conce a conceptual coincidence with its representations. The verbs themselves refer both to the actions of the gods in the image and to Minerva's act of depicting them. The gods sit around, I can um, go back to the... Um, uh, so, sit uh, around the sedent, uh, Neptune stands, stare, uh, while she gives herself her own attributes, a shield, a spear, and a helmet, that clipeum, that, acute, that astam, that uh, galleum, almost as if she inhabits her own tap tapestry. For her part, Arachne seems to perceive her work from a certain uh, distance. Uh, the text emphasizes that she's consciously creating an illusion. Um, I can see the, the lines, sorry. Oh. Okay, um, so, uh, verum uh, taurum freta vera putares, and making her tapestry, her tapestry, fecit et asterien, 
fake it laidum. As Oliensis observes again, Minerva's art lies because it claims to be the truth, while Arachnis tells the truth because it flaunts its power to deceive. While Oliensis and other critics are interested in emphasizing both the aesthetic and political implications of Ovid's treatment of, Arachne's, of Arachne as a skilled artist, today I would like to focus more specifically on the way Arachne's job as an artisan is described and conceived. As the title of my talk indicates, uh, on this approach, Arachnis metamorphosis into a spider plays an important role, since it concretely embodies the transformation of her ability to wave by means of a reduction of her work to pure labor. Um, Courtney uh, Robbie made this distinction. You can you can read on the on the um, on the slide. Uh, these observations are particularly uh, particularly relevant since they point to an aspect of a specifically Roman conception of, for instance, the relationship between labor per se as and an expertise. They seem to have been perceived not as interdependent in the way we tend to conceive them today. In other words, the fact that Arachne and in the Ovidian narrative prov uh, provided to be proved, sorry, to be a fantastically inventive artist does not redeem her from being an animal's labyrinth of humble origins. Her wonderful work, like the work of any other uh, talented artist or artisan, was not perceived as an improvement to her social status. Now I would like to add uh, some of uh, Hannah Arendt's reflections, in particular from the second uh, chapter of The Human Condition, devoted precisely to the concept of work. In particular, she considers a difference between labor and work characteristic of European languages and yet widely ignored in practice. In particular, Arendt points out that this distinction was completely ignored in classical antiquity when other mental schemes were operating. The differentiation between public and private sphere, between politics and the household, and between masters and slaves overshadowed and determined all other distinctions. Arendt also finds it surprising that modern age, which substantially reversed the ancient pattern by putting the vita activa and the glorification of labor before contemplative activity, i.e. preferring the animals, animal laborants to the animal rationale, never produced a theory in which animal laborants and homo faber the labor of our body and the work of our hands are clearly distinguished. She further observes that laboring is an activity which leaves nothing behind, the result of its effort being invisible and in fact coincident with laboring itself. Another thought provoking point in Arendt's chapter is that the laboring activity itself possesses indeed a productivity on its own, no matter how futile or not durable its, its products might be. And I, um, I read, uh, unlike the productivity of work, she adds new objects to the human, which adds uh, new objects to the human artifice. The productivity of labor power produces objects only incidentally and is primarily concerned with means of its own reproduction. Since its power is not exhausted, when its own reproduction has been secured, it can be used for the reproduction of more than one life process, but it never produces anything but life. In the section entitled Labor and Life, Arendt uh, distinguishes between two senses of life, which are well expressed by the Greek terms bios and zoe. Bios is human life in its historical appearance, as it can be described in a narrative such as biography, while Zoe designates life in its purely organic essence as a biological being in the world. 
action and spe action and speech definitely belong to Pius. It is only within the human world that nature's cyclical movement manifests itself as growth and decay, says Arendt. Whereas nature has no time other than the cyclical and it is represented by uh, re repetition. Here Arendt introduces another powerful distinction, unlike working whose end has come when the object is finished, laboring always moves in the same circle, which is described by the biological process of the living organism and the end of its toil and trouble comes only with the death of this living organism. Let us now briefly return to Ovid, whose text can arguably be read from a different perspective with Arendt's consideration in mind, considerations in, in mind. Let us consider some minor but revealing details. After Minerva beats her adversary with the, the very instrument of wedding, the shuttle, Arachne is mute. She does not react to the goddess's aggression with words, and now seems characterized solely by her actions, in sharp contrast with her initial eloquent tirade against the old woman Minerva. Her tapestry arguably has now fully replaced her speech. She then tries to commit, a suicide, commit suicide, i.e. in Arendt's terms, to put her bios to an end. But Minerva intervenes a less time, vive quidem pande tamen improba, live on wicked girl, um, but keep hanging. Um, the profound meaning of this gruesome punishment becomes quite transparent. Arachnis Bios, as a living human being and as an active artist, needs to be put to an end. But her Zoe, Balta Benjamin, and in, in his steps, Giorgio Agamben would call it Das Blosse Leben, the bare life, will continue. But how precisely will this purely organic life continue? By a unique but very appropriate activity. Arachne, us uh, and her offspring, will keep hanging from the thread forever. Ovid gives another interesting detail. Um, and you can read the passage. Um, as Rosati observes in his uh, commentary, uh, not only was Minerva born from Jupiter's head, but this part of the body best represents her identity. I would add that by minimizing Arachne's head and disproportionately enhancing her belly, from which comes the very thread that she will be working without interruption, the goddess seems to condemn the girl to an insignificant life at Zoe that becomes an exemplarily cruel reduction precisely of her skills. The fact that the thread, the raw material needed for weaving is produced directly from Arachne's belly, Arachne's belly implies on the one hand that nothing on the, of the beautiful and complex tapestry will remain in the spider's web, and on the other, that the thread no longer is a tool for creativity, but becomes a cruel, very badly necessity. Inspired by Arendt, we could say that this transformation into a spider condemns Arachne to transform her previous op magnificent opus into a worthless and insignificant web, and astonishingly to wholly identify herself with her, with her own relentless activity. The spider is indeed its own web, so that a distinction between labor and work cannot be made. Uh, Nandini, do you have another five minutes? I think that would be fine. Yes, we'll still okay. end on time, so it'll take a little time from questions, but please continue. Okay, great. We'd Thank you. Um, Seneca, in uh, this uh, epistle, discusses the instincts of animals, arguing that it belongs to their nature to recognize and distinguish among useful and, detrim uh, and detrimental factors and to adapt to them. Towards the end of its uh, of his discussion, uh, Seneca brings up the example of the spider. Um, on the one hand, the philosopher praises the work of the spiders as inimitable by humans, but on the other, he points out that their webs cannot be distinguished from each other since all look the same. 
there are is not something to be learned since it is in innate within the insect. It is its very instinct. Then is Fini is perhaps too quick to conclude that according to Seneca, the spider work, as he says, is not art. Their webs are indeed ours, so perfect that it cannot be imitated and reproduced by men, and are yet reproducible ad infinitum by individual spiders themselves, who are not more or less skilled than any other spiders. Nullum est animal alterodoxius, as he says, just as any bee can build uh, the same kind of honeycomb. Minerva's punishment seems therefore to contain this cruel additional effect. Arachne as a spider is deprived of the very possibility of competing with any other spider, since her web, no matter how perfectly constructed it might look, is destined to be, to be equal to any other web. In the, it is in this sense that not only Arachne is transformed, her own uh, work undergoes a perhaps even crueler metamorphosis, namely from, from work to labor. Let me finish uh, with uh, um, a consideration um, uh, following up the, uh, the organizer's invitation to consider possible uh, connections uh, to um, academic life. And I guess I can stop my presentation here. Uh, from this perspective, this Ovidian episode might be read as a wonderful allegory, precisely of academic interpersonal relationships, and also of a point that has struck me for some time, namely how many scholars seem almost compelled to embody their own occupation, to identify with it in a way that establishes their own subjective sense of who they are. To briefly pursue this allegory, both Minerva and Arachne could be seen as scholars, perhaps Ovidian scholars, busily working on their own interpretation of some mythic episodes. Minerva is an established professor of classics, while Arachne is an extremely talented and pertinacious junior scholar um, who doesn't even acknowledge the value of her famous more senior colleague. Her punishment is terrible, not only because it annihilates her wonderful her hermeneutic skills and sensibilities, but more intriguingly, because it irrepar irreparably establishes her own identity as what she does. To conclude this brief thoughts on a very personal note, I could not imagine a crueler punishment for myself than that. I do not want to be fully identified with my scholarship, nor do I want to create one coherent scholarly persona and then pursue it forever. And this is precisely what poor Arachnis, in my opinion, is compelled to do, to be wholly assimilated to her work so that it eventually becomes labor. Thank you.